Hello again, friends. I am Steve Taylor, one of the illustrious crew at FThatNoisePod.com. I'm continuing my series, Steve Attempts to Read, and we'll cover the prologue and chapter one of Homecoming, book two in my series in this video. Uh, this and the previous videos are now streaming on both YouTube and at our website, FThatNoisePod.com. There is also a link at my personal website, staylorbooks.com. And if you click on the YouTube channel, uh, make sure to subscribe to my channel. You'll get notifications for any new videos that I post, and you'll have access to all the older ones. Um, as always, this video and all other content will be brought to you by Trashman Media. Uh, Trashman Media, for the latest home video reviews of films you may not see in your local Redbox, visit them at trashmanmedia.com. Also brought to you by Bizarre Abyss, the site dedicated to news and straight talk. Visit them at bizarreabyss.com. And don't forget to check out our number one podcast among people reading to you right now. This guy. F That Noise. Check us out every Monday night at fthatnoisepod.com. And parents, the podcast is not for young ears. It's raunchy and it is fantastic. Um, also, if you're on Facebook, um, I have a link on my, um, my Facebook fan page for the MASC. It's a mic artistic uh, script readers uh we pretty much it's a bunch of very talented actors get together and we read um different scripts i tend to narrate most of these because i am not a good actor um but it's just reading different plays uh we actually just tonight uh did a reading of reservoir dogs the quentin tarantino screenplay uh with some slight minor minor change just to just to make it a little um, fresher for modern times uh, but it's great. And so if you're interested, look it up at facebook.com. Look it up M-A-S-C and it'll bring it up for you to check out. Once again, you look at my uh, fan page on Facebook, which is under um, staylorbooks87.com. Uh, you look that up and you'll be able to find all that information. Uh, and if you do like what you hear tonight, and if you like what you hear in the previous videos where I was reading the lockbox, you can find links to purchase both books on my website, staylorbooks.com. Uh, there is a paperback version and a digital version for both. I am currently working on book three. It is just taking forever because I have so many other side things going on. Uh, one of them actually being a children's book that I'm pretty close to finishing the first draft of. And I'm hoping to have that out by the end of the summer to early fall. Um, so look for that. I will probably do a reading for that as well. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to be sticking to the current series. All right. So without further ado, we are reading Homecoming, which is book one of the Echoes trilogy. Prologue. June 3rd, 1348, Ferrara, Italy. Throughout the bustling streets of Ferrara, a, car, a corpse, the corpse of those who had succumbed to the mysterious illness from the West were piled like refuse waiting to be discarded. The terror of this malady was everlasting. Once a person had become accustomed to the smell of the dead, they would have to deal with the moans and wails of the dying and those who mourned them. This region of the world was originally isolated from the disease. Only after the pestilence had, was brought to Genoa did it eventually spread over Europe like the dark cloud of death. The early warning signs would soon become known by all. The first symptom was the coughing, followed by a small outbreak of fever. Then the black oozing boils would appear, preceded by the inevitable demise of the infirmed. Most civilians knew little of this plague or its origins. Their only source of information came from the church and its insistence on faith in these trying times. Words that comforted and misled millions of families. One such family lived south of town. Cyril Del Pino and his wife Elena owned a simple goat farm in the countryside. The cozy homestead they shared with their small son was surrounded by the most beautiful landscape imaginable. The trees flowered each spring with pink and white petals that chased each other in the breeze like children playing tag. Just behind the home was a brook that flowed from the nearby hills. Its banks would attract the local wildlife who gleefully bathed and romped in its cool waters. After the outbreak, Ciro did what he could to keep his family isolated from the reach of the disease, but he had failed. His young son Aldo had contracted the disease in May and by early June he was gone. Now Ciro's wife Elena lay wrapped in blankets, shivering and crying as the agony from her crippling malady drove her mad with despair. 
Seemingly immune to the effects of the disease, Sudo never fell victim to its touch. With each passing day, he watched in horror as his lovely young wife fell evermore into its grasp. Elena was all he had left in the world, and she was quickly slipping away. Day in and day out, he would remain steadfast by her side. Break. It was on a dark and tempestuous summer's morning that a stranger would stagger in from the deluge. His crimson cloak billowed in the wind as a powerful gale forced upon the door to the small farmhouse. After slamming the door behind him, the large man removed his cloak and shook the water from his head. His ominous frame was covered with an immense dan tan doublet that was adorned with bloodstains and char. The giant's heavily scarred hands and face were a resume of one who had seen the glory of battle on many occasions. His massive body was blanketed by a large woolen cloak. As he removed the rain-sodden covering, he let out a satisfying grunt. For Christ's sake, the man grumbled as he shook the water from his head. What a bloody mess out there. It's as if the gods themselves were trying to wash us from the earth. Surveying the small house, the man was perplexed by the lack of interest over his rival. Ciro silently wept in the corner of the room, Elena's cold hand lifeless in his own. The frail woman lay motionless as her deep brown eyes stared off into nothingness. Realizing what had occurred, the large man removed the mighty broadsword from his hip and flung it to the ground with a clang. Stop your wailing, boy. You should sound like a bloody woman. Ciro wiped the tears from his eyes and turned his face to his guest. Get the hell out of my house and leave me in peace. The visitor roared with laughter at the feeble demands of the broken man before him. Well, it seems like you might have some balls after all. Wiping the spit from the corners of his mouth, the man sat down at a small wooden table that stood adjacent to the hearth. Now bring me some wine, boy. I have traveled far. You must not have heard me, Ciro spoke behind his clenched teeth. I would appreciate it if you left me and my wife alone. Ciro gently set down Elena's hand and reached for his sword. This caused the man to once again erupt in a fit of unbridled laughter. Put that away before you do something stupid. You're just like your mother, too goddamn emotional. Enraged by the jab, Ciro charged at him with his sword held high. The much larger man pushed the sturdy table away with his powerful arms, striking Ciro in the midsection with a solid piece of timber. Standing with the quickness of someone half his size, Ciro's guest stuck struck the stunned man in the face with one mighty swipe. Ciro soared across the room and into a pile of firewood stacked in the rear of the cabin. You must have a death wish, boy. You dare raise your sword to your own father? Crawling to his knees, Ciro wiped the blood from his nose. I will gladly leave this foul world in peace with the knowledge that you will be joining me in hell. The towering figure lumbered over to Ciro and smacked him in the mouth with his massive right hand. No son of Tano del Pino will speak to him in this way. You don't have to like me, but you will obey and respect me. You are not raised to be weak. Tano grabbed the trembling arm of his son and dragged his semi-conscious body over to the table, dropping him onto the bench with a resounding thud. Ciro coughed up a handful of blood as he tried to sit up. A weak man <coughs> doesn't ask for death. He fears it. I neither fear nor run from death. I will welcome its embrace with open arms. Great. Now you're a poet, Tano quipped as he wiped the blood from his hands. I have traveled a great distance to see you, and now I'm not leaving until we come to an understanding. Ciro just chuckled at the thought of him and his father agreeing on anything. What understanding is that? You are my flesh and blood, and when I need your help, you will do whatever you can to help me. Ciro spit a well of blood on Tano's large hand as he laughed at his father's request. In one quick motion, Tano backhanded Ciro in the mouth, causing him to collapse onto the table. Fighting to remain conscious, he grabbed the ends of the table and hoped that it would cause the room to stop spinning. As Ciro was composing himself, Tano made his way into the pantry and retrieved a bottle of wine and two glasses. Sitting back at the table, he poured two large glasses of wine and emptied his in one massive gulp. Are you ready to listen or shall I bloody you some more? Ciro raised his hand 
his head enough to look into his father's eyes. That will depend on what you say next. Fair enough. Now drink something, shut your mouth, and listen. Tano filled his glass once more before he began. I have fought for many lords in my day, but it was my time fighting for the church that I did some truly horrific things. For five years I was tasked with hunting down and slaughtering so-called heretics. Each life taken was done so in the name of the one true God. It didn't matter what age, color, or nationality they were. Those in my circle were blinded by faith and promised redemption for their many sins. Tano drank some wine as he tried to compose himself. Nothing I had done in my past could compare to what I did for those bastards. Visions of striking down infants suckling on their mother's tit still haunt my dreams. Cyril looked on in shock. How could you have done those things? The power of belief is one that can cause men to do terrible things. Tano wiped a tear from the corner of his eye. He glanced over at Cyril. Don't you dare judge me, boy. I've seen you gut men for petty reasons. What I did was in the name of God. Cyril had furious, was furious with the comparison. I am not like you. Nothing would ever make me raise my sword to a child. Tano tipped back another full glass of wine and wiped the red from his lips. The two men sat in silence for a few moments before Tano spoke again. It's my burden to bear. I only wish to keep others from having to make the same choice as I did. And how do you plan on doing this? I'm getting to that. Have a drink and listen. Cyril swiped his wine as he rubbed his bro broken jaw. Fine. Tano stretched his massive arms and let out a loud groan. Six months ago, a small group of us started to question our mission. At first, these were nothing more than whispers around the fire. It wasn't until the church responded to this dark plague with utter nonsense and misinformation that we realized it was time to act. I watched friends and lovers die mere, more, mere days after showing the first symptoms. When I sought help, I was told to pray for their souls of the sick and that the love of the Lord would protect them. With each death... My faith diminished, diminished. Stricken with immeasurable grief, I began to seek out the help of those I had once brutalized. I was shocked to learn that this plague could be prevented with the proper precautions. It became apparent that the church and their leadership did not have the best interests in mind. Soon science became my new god. Cyril was intrigued by his father's story. What did you do? It was time to gather my new army and strike out against the most powerful organization in the world. Tano reached across the table and grabbed his son's arm. You, my son, are the final chapter of my story. Cyril shook his head. What the, what the hell are you talking about? There is one thing I need to tip the scales in our favor. I need my son by my side. Cyril sat back and contemplated all that he had just heard. I don't understand why you would need my help. We've barely spoken in the last ten years. You are not just my son, but also one of the best fighters I have ever gone to battle with, or at least you used to be. Tano raised his glass and downed another gulp of wine. What you have become is shameful. You used to be worthy of my name and lineage. Now you're as useless and weak as that rotting corpse. Tano pointed over to the candlelit bed in the back. This enraged Shiro, who slapped the cup from his father's hand and swiftly buried the tip of his small dagger in the Tano's throat. Don't you ever speak of her in that way again. Tano shook his head in approval. Now that's my boy. It warms my heart to see the killer I've raised. I knew he was still in there. Tano slowly pulled the blade from his throat as Ciro's hand shook uncontrollably. Now the question is, what will you do? Will you wallow in misery with the ghosts of those you lost, or will you join me and enact revenge against those who helped cause this pain? Break. I know my voices are not the best, but I'm trying to distinguish uh, between the actors. I hope you're getting a laugh out of it and enjoying it so far. Cyril looked over to the peaceful remains of his beloved Elena as she lay motionless in the dark. The day had turned to night in what felt like an instant. It had been hours since Tano had informed Cyril of his intentions and the role Cyril would play in the new world. Tano had left the small hovel a few hours earlier upon Cyril's request. The bombastic man gave Ciro a headache, and he needed all the senses he, to make such a difficult decision. Tano planned on returning after dark. He would be leaving that night with or without his son. 
With a heavy heart, Cyril arose from his seat. In the corner of the room, there was a termite-infested wooden chest. He made his way over to it and broke the seal that had kept its contents, hidden from his family. Within the chest were the tools of a violent life he had turned his back on long ago. Once dressed in the mix of armor and musty clothing, he retrieved his sword from the floor and attached it to his hip. Kneeling next to his wife's bed, he said his tearful goodbye. Sorry, I was not able to help you, my love. You and Aldo will always be in my thoughts, and I only ask that you both hide, you both shield, hide your eyes from what I'm about to do. I want you to remember me as the man you knew, not the man I truly am. Ciro leaned in and kissed her cold skin. He grabbed the large blanket that covered his wife's lifeless form, brought it up to his nose and inhaled. The sweet smell of death that enveloped the soft fabric gave him a sense of peace. He stood with the blanket held tight in his grasp, then he turned to leave. When he reached for the door, Ciro tossed the blanket onto the candles that surrounded his love. Like the phoenix, he would be reborn in fire. Break. Tano looked on impatiently as Ciro exited the house. The tempest that had raged for the last few days still punished the countryside with its unrelenting force. Rain fell sideways across the nearby fields, but nothing seemed to faze the two men on their steeds. Ciro mounted his horse and took one last look at the home that he had sacrificed so much for. I'm ready. Tano nodded his approval and slowly led them into the darkness. As the two men disappeared into the night, the small structure burst into flames. The bleak howling of the relentless storm was now illuminated by the glow of the inferno. The devil had called upon the small farmhouse this night, and with him the fires of hell were about to be unleashed upon the world. That's the end of the prologue. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I really wanted to delve deep into some of the backstory of, of a lot of these characters, so I hope you enjoyed that first part. We are going to go on to chapter one, and this will be the last chapter for the day. So chapter one, title, The First Date. From the instant their eyes met, Sinon was smitten. He had first noticed the golden skin beauty from across the busy street, her face aglow from the shimmer of the morning sunrise. To his surprise, the young woman had been the first to steal a glance before abruptly turning away. The bone-white sundress she wore clung to her bronze athletic frame. Her light brown hair was tucked neatly in a tight bun, except for a loose strand that kept, she kept having to playfully reposition behind her ear. He had followed her around the streets of Oya that morning, keeping his distance. The last thing he wanted was to spook her away before he had gained the courage to act. He spent the first hour trying to come up with just the right words he would use to attempt to woo this beauty. He was a portly man in his mid-thirties who lived with his mother. His few remaining strands of hair were pasted across his head by a handful of pomade and a little bit of artistic flair. Sinon's lack of confidence would continue to fuel his growing frustration. His quest would have been abandoned long ago if not for the subtle glances and smiles she would direct his way from time to time. Each moment that she turned her head, he was sure she was focused on him. Of course, this could all be in his mind, but how many times in life do you get this opportunity? The time was swiftly approaching noon, and the sun was now slow roasting the inhabitants of the coastal Greek city. Sinon was sweating bullets, and his armpits looked and smelled like rancid cesspools. Undeterred, he continued his surveillance. The young beauty had studied the products in each window that she passed and shamelessly flirted with the population of men that dotted the streams. She would exit each shop empty-handed after perusing the many trinkets and local treasures, always leaving a crestfallen suitor in her wake. Now exhausted and extremely uncomfortable, Sinon was about to call it quits. That's when it happened. The woman turned and looked straight at him. She placed her delicate fingers across her cherry red lips and blew him a sweet, flirtatious kiss. Sinon stared at her in disbelief, his mouth again. His heart pumped wildly. She motioned for him to follow her as she ducked into the alley just off the main street. As if shot out of a cannon, the plump man raced across the street in pursuit. Sinone was entranced by the mysterious beauty, and the world around them just didn't matter anymore. He entered the alley with the echoes, with the echoes of the marketplace drowned out by the beating of his heart. His footsteps thudded on the brick path, even though at this moment he felt like he was floating two feet off the ground. Halfway down the path, he found, he found the young woman 
turning a corner towards the waterfront. She made sure to pause long enough for him to catch her. As he met her stride, she turned to him and softly spoke. Don't be shy, she whispered. Sanon was caught off guard at first, but he quickly became intrigued. Intrigued. You're American. I am. I hope that's okay. It is good. I speak a little English, but enough. My name is Sanon. The girl blushed as they continued down to the nearest dock. I'll try not to talk too fast, sweetie, but I do get shy around cute guys. She giggled as she nervously swept her hair back behind her ear. I'm Sarah. It was as if he was given a shot of adrenaline with a confidence chaser. Sanon stood a little straighter as they continued. I, cu I couldn't help noticing you looking at me back there. <laughs> Excuse me on that. I couldn't help you noticing you looking at me back there, she commented as they stepped onto the concrete dock. I have to admit, I was glad you understood my invitation. Sorry about that. You are very beautiful, he stammered. She smiled as she brushed a stray hair from her face. You're sweet. They walked in awkward silence for a few minutes before stopping in front of a small but elegant yacht. The 70-foot Uretti was white with blue trim down the side. The name on the back confused Sinon. He did not know what Dr. Love meant. The young woman placed her foot upon the plank leading up to the ship, then stopped and turned around towards Sinon with a coy smile. Would you like to come in? Whose boat is this? It's my daddy's, but him and mama went on a drive. They won't be back for hours. Sinon wiped his now drenched hands on his trousers as he tried to process exactly what was happening. The young woman began to turn towards the boat. I mean, if you don't want to, no, no he shouted. I would like very much. The petite beauty whipped around, her lips upturned into a satisfied grin. She reached out her hand and led the portly man onto the vessel. As he stepped onto the deck, he thought he heard his name. He looked around, but the docks were barren. It must have been his imagination. Sano knew it was his lucky day as the door to the portside cabin shut behind him. He sat on the bed and watched Sarah pour herself a shot of vodka at the same teak bar in the corner of the room. Would you like anything, sweetie? His mouth was completely dry from fear, but he knew he would regret having anything that would interfere with his enjoyment of the afternoon festivities. No, thank you. I am good. You're so polite. I like that. Sarah finished her glass of clear liquid with one swift gulp. Slamming the empty glass down hard on the counter, she turned back towards the known and leaned seductively against the bar. She began to play with the hem of her dress, each time showing the man just a small peak of her toned legs. Sinone gulped and wiped the sweat from his brow. He had dreamt about moments like this while watching late-night cable television, but he never would have believed it could happen to him. Why don't you come over here? I want to show you something, she said as she slowly moved her hands along her waist. Sinone stood up and moved closer, quivering with anticipation. He was now within reach of his fantasy. The air was flush with the sweet perfume emanating from the small of her neck. I have, I have never done this before, he stammered. Just relax, sugar, she whispered with a grin. I'll show you how it's done. As the words left her lips, she yanked an object from under her dress and jabbed it into the Sinoin's groan, groin. His excitement soon turned to panic as 50,000 volts traveled swiftly through his body. He convulsed uncontrollably before slipping out of consciousness. Well, that's it for chapter one. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, I am reading two chapters per uh, episode. It puts each one of these YouTube videos at about a half hour, so I think that's perfect. Uh, once again, I am not a professional at this, so I am doing my best with the reading. I just hope you enjoy the story. Uh, once again, if you like what you hear, please go on to Amazon.com. Uh, look up Homecoming. Uh, if you put in Stephen J. Taylor, Homecoming, and then sometimes it even asks for Echoes Book One, it'll come up. The easiest way is to go to staylorbooks.com. Um, there are cl clicks on both the main page and under other works for both this book and the lockbox. Uh, it'll take you directly to get either the paperback or digital version. Okay? And I thank you so much, and I look forward to another video next week. Have a wonderful evening.